Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to the Graduate Institute of International Development Studies in Geneva for this online conversation. Today, we will have the pleasure to discuss about financial inclusion and development with the case of the AB Bank Zambia. I will allow our participants to join and to log in in our webinar. Uh, welcome again to this uh, online conversation about financial inclusion and development and the case of AB Bank Zambia. While people are logging in, I will perhaps just very briefly introduce myself. My name is Alexandre Meyer-Frère. I am the director of the Executive Master in Development Policies and Practices, one of our executive education programs here at the Graduate Institute, where we do discuss, of course, issues in relation to financial inclusion. And this is one of the reasons why we decided to put the spotlight on this very important topic in the field of development today uh, for this online conversation. Um, uh, of course, uh, we'll have the pleasure to have this online conversation with our guest speaker. And I would like to warmly welcome Mr. Cosmin Olteanu, who is the CEO of the AB Bank of Zambia. Welcome, Cosmin. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. It's a pleasure to be here. And maybe perhaps, Cosmin, uh, can I kindly ask you to introduce yourself a little bit before we start? Yeah, I, I would also like to, to uh, welcome the participants. I see some familiar names in the list. I see Christina from Kampala, I guess. Uh, Christina Boruzzo from the EU delegation in, no, it should be in Kampala. Um, I see also some colleagues, uh, Monsieur Vladimir, uh, representing our French uh, connection here. So um, yeah, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you, Alexander, for, for this invitation. Um, we are more than 30 people, so um, how to keep it short? So uh, yeah, my name is Cosmin. I'm, I'm coming from Romania. Um, I work in microfinance um, for the past 20 years, basically since I started working. Um, formally. Um, I am in Zambia since three years. I'm the CEO of AB Bank Zambia. Um, AB Bank Zambia, uh, a small uh, commercial bank uh, in the country, uh, a bank which in the past uh, three years made uh, big strides in, uh, in offering and uh, um, uh, promoting financial inclusion countrywide. And uh, I think this is what we will talk. Um, uh, we will talk uh, during the, this uh, less than an hour that we we have today. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Cosmin, for your introduction. So indeed, we're going to spend uh, more or less an hour together today about uh, discussing about this connection between financial inclusion and development, and trying to understand a little bit more what are the connections between uh, financial inclusion and development. And for that, let me just perhaps walk you through uh, the outline. Uh, we are going to start to discuss a little bit, Cosmin, if you allow me to give me a few minutes to perhaps define it uh, a little bit, what we mean by, by financial inclusion. The idea, of course, here is not necessarily to go very far much into details about how we define this concept theoretically, but at least to set a little bit the background and the scene, just so we come an understanding about what are the main definitions in that field so that we have this kind of background in mind when we start the discussion. It's because of course, then the main idea would be to illustrate a little bit this, this theoretical discussions with the case of the AB Bank Zambia and to see a little bit how you guys at AB Bank Zambia are precisely using that concept in your daily activities uh, in, in Zambia. And in other words, it's more to learn from precisely the practice to see concretely how financial inclusion works and to have a kind of a inductive approach, I would say, from the field to feel to fit our knowledge about uh, financial inclusion using, of course, the case of AB uh, Bank Zambia. So this is a little bit what uh, we are going to do. So let me let me start, Cosme, if you uh, if you allow me to perhaps yeah. just um, just really and also for our participants that again I warmly welcome. Uh, and and uh, before I start, let me just also mention this to our participants. You can always interact with us because the idea, as we discussed with Cosmin, is to have a conversation, but also to interact with our participants. So if you'd like to raise a question, even when we are talking, do not hesitate to post your questions in the QA box. If you don't mind the QA box that you have uh, on the right side, I think of your, of your toolbar, Zoom toolbar, um, and please use that QA box. It's easier first then to manage your questions. And then we will be happy, of course, during our conversation to to answer these queries are coming from uh, from the audience. So do not hesitate if you would like us to, to, to ask us a question. 
use please the Q&A box. So I was saying, let's start perhaps with setting the scene a little bit, uh, Cosmin, by, by giving, you know, a certain, let's say, not a definition, of course, but let's say try to find the main characteristics in, in, in like five minutes, so it's a challenge, but let's try to see if we can do that in the five minutes, just to, again, give a little bit of background about what we mean by financial uh, inclusion. Um, if we start perhaps with some key actors in the field, like the World Bank, um, uh, financial inclusion, as defined by the World Bank, means that individuals and businesses have access to useful and affordable financial products and services that can meet their needs um, in terms of, for instance, uh, transactions, payments, savings, credit insurance that are delivered in a responsible and sustainable way. So that would be a very common definition used by the World Bank that has launched an initiative, by the way, that is called Universal uh, Financial Access 2020 Initiative, that actually the main idea is to precisely include those who don't have access to financial services. Today, it is estimated that around 2 billion people are, according to the words of the World Bank, unbanked precisely, and that's more than, than three quarters, around 75% of them are located in 25 countries around the world, um, mostly in Latin America, Africa, and Asia, right? So you see there is still a lot of uh, things to be done in that field to ensure that everybody has an access, uh, a fair access and a good access to financial services. If we take another uh, key actor here is of course the United Nations Capital Development Fund, uh, which I think highlights something that is very important, uh, Cosmin, according to me, uh, meaning that financial inclusion is not the end goal, but it's a mean to multiple ends. And that's very important to, to mention. The idea of course is that with this financial services access, we can do other things to develop small and medium enterprises, for instance, to develop my own business, et cetera. And that's something that is quite meaningful, right? So the meaningful financial inclusion has to provide outlets for um, uh, low income uh, account holders, right? To engage in the economy in order to meet their daily needs, but also of course, to improve their skills, productivity, marketability, uh, especially in this era of digital uh, economy age, but not only, but also for people that are, let's say in more uh, remote locations as well. So this would, of course, be also another important aspect um, when it comes to defined financial inclusion. If we look at different sources uh, of literature uh, on this topic, uh, what we can find as a common, let's say, trend is of, we can perhaps define three main dimensions uh, when we talk about financial inclusions, right? The first one is, of course, the question of access. And I'm sure we're going to discuss this together with, with Cosmin, because it's very important to ensure a good access to financial services. Um, then the question of use, right, and quality. Um, the question of use is uh, how these financial services can be used effectively, right, and that the objectives of this financial service uh, are clear, in other words, right. And obviously the quality refers to the quality of the service provided, because it's also important that the institution that provides these financial uh, services can ensure some sort of quality in the products they are, they are providing to their customers and clients, right? Um, why is question perhaps that we can have, you know, uh, why is financial in inclusion important in the field of development or development policies? Well, of course, again, we can debate for this for hours and to highlight why this is important. But one, I think the most important thing is probably to see that in less developed countries, as I mentioned earlier, it's 75% of unbanked people are precisely in uh, the developing world. People are less, financially included when they live in rural areas or when they belong to vulnerable groups. And that is something that is part of, you know, the global struggle against inequalities and providing a fair access to everybody to services in general, right, beyond financial services. Um, uh, similarly as well, uh, obviously that uh, we know that financial, there are many studies actually have shown that, um, that, uh, that low rates of financial inclusion reduces levels of development in, in countries, right? By providing a good access to financial services, you can support the development of, of small businesses, for instance. You can also integrate people in the economic life in general. And by doing so, you increase the opportunities for those people to have a decent life, to have a good income or a decent income to indeed uh, um, have better living conditions in general, right? So this is why um, um, this should be considered or this is a priority or something important in the field of economic development. And that's the reason why policymakers should, of course, consider policies to increase financial uh, inclusion in order to sustain 
local development processes. It's an important component of it if you want to ensure local development processes. So this was just very briefly in a few minutes, I think Osmin, uh, forgive me if I, if I forgot some, some important aspects of it, but it's a challenge to define this just in a few minutes time. But the idea is really to set the scene of you see that probably many other dimensions that are that are that are perhaps missing here. But but, but perhaps to start the conversation, because I mean, mm. my first question precisely in relation to this very broad definition that I just gave, um, I would perhaps to hear from you, how do you at AB Bank Zambia, in your perspective, define precisely uh, financial inclusion? How do you use that or how do you operationalize, if I may use that word, this mm. notion of final inclusion in your daily activities? And can you perhaps tell us a little bit more specifically more precisely about rural finances uh, and how you mm -hmm. practice that. Mm. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. I, um, <clears throat> I would start from, from the, the definition that you quoted from UNCDF um, of um, financial inclusion being an enabler. Um, it, it also helps to set the record straight uh, in this diffuse area of microfinance, financial inclusion, uh, uh, Dr. Muhammad Yunus got the Nobel uh, Peace Prize, although he's an economist, no, interesting, um, for, for his, his early work in what was microfinance and uh, group microfinance. Uh, and initially microfinance was seen as a, a silver bullet uh, against poverty. As, as we all know, life is not so simple, so poor people, very poor people do not need microfinance. They need uh, health, sanitation, water. Um, now, when the poor people become less poor, let's say that the country is stable and uh, people climb up of the poverty of the $1 per day, or now it's $1.8 per day um, uh, poverty threshold, then um, they have some, some money aside and they say, look, I could do, I could do something more. Yeah? And uh, the, the easiest way to do this is to, to buy, for example, um, uh, what is called here chitenge, or uh, in, in Congo, I think it's called uh, pani, I think, like uh, tissues uh, or, and cloth and fabric, and to sell them for a little margin. Now, in order to do this, you already are in, the, in a sort of a money slash financial system. You need to buy, you need to sell, you need to transfer, you need to save. And this is where microfinance, microfinance or what is called now financial inclusion comes in. So basically uh, it's an enabler for first of all, business initiative, uh, basically related to the example I gave. And it's also an enabler for independence. Now, what does this mean concretely? Well, um, um, sometimes, you know, uh, it's, it's mainly the women who move, uh, who move a family forward, you know, takes care of the children and uh, sometimes men are, are drinking a bit a bit too much you know are, are not uh, not so good in uh, managing the house finances and of course it is a risk if the money that you make in a day uh, is kept at home because maybe your husband comes uh, beats you gets the money and goes drinking um, what does financial inclusion do it uh, allows uh, this woman and by the way uh, the majority of, of customers, almost 60% <clears throat> of uh, AB Bank Zambia are women. It allows them uh, the independence. It gives them the independence and the security of having a savings account or having an account where to keep this money. Um, safe uh, while they are traveling, accessible, uh, and so on. So I would say this is what, uh, what we at AB Bank Zambia do. We First of all, we enable small businesses to grow and we, we, we accompany them in their growth. Um, and we give um, our, our clients uh, independence, financial independence. Um, things are even more interesting in the, in the field of rural finance um, because there, there is another complication which comes in place, which is uh, the overall access, access to roads, access to market, um, access to information. So this is really, uh, as, as, uh, as I'm talking to my colleagues, some, some of them are in this call, uh, rural finance is really the last frontier. And uh, the same, uh, the same uh, picture applies in, in the case of rural finance. Um, 
I, I, I think what, what rural, uh, when we talk about rural finance in the context of financial inclusion, we are, uh, the, the key here would be uh, smallholder and emergent farmers. Now, this is a farmer that um, was going from subsistence, meaning uh, I was growing uh, maize and potatoes and beans for my family. But all of a sudden, and now the question of access comes, and not access to finance, but access to infrastructure, all of a sudden, the road, which was for decades a um, uh, dirt road, is now a, a tarred road, and there are many cars and many trucks passing. So I will start selling at the side of the road and make some money. Uh, so I become from a subsistence farmer, meaning producing only for myself, to an emergent farmer. And then I make some money and then I realize, look, it's going pretty well. What about uh, that I buy a truck myself and go to the city? which was not possible before, but it's possible now. Talking about development, everything has to be seen in a comprehensive context. You know, microfinance or financial inclusion cannot build this road. It's not possible. Um, so then this, this farmer says, look, I, I want to buy a truck now. <clears throat> um, and also talking about the information asymmetry that you, that you brought. Now, who gives a loan to this farmer? Well, nobody, <laughs> because nobody knows him. Uh, he doesn't have a credit scoring. He doesn't have a bank account. Uh, he doesn't have any uh, transaction history. He doesn't have anything. So um, this is when this is where financial inclusion comes. And um, yeah, please, you want to yeah, go? But, but precisely, um, thank you so much, Kasmin, for for, mm. for for all this. But precisely, I, I'm you know when I when I was preparing this a little bit, and I, and I of course the the, the question of access came as something quite important. Um, and perhaps my, my question here is, is, how do you successfully identify potential clients or customers to have access to your financial services, especially having in mind these vulnerable populations that they are living in remote areas, mm -hmm. women, uh, et cetera? How do, you, how, do you, how do we identify them concretely? How does that work? Yeah, the simple answer, you have to go there. You have to go there, this side of the road. The complicated answer is complicated. <laughs> so w why is it complicated? Because of course, uh, um, you cannot just go and look for somebody. You, um, um, the, the, in the past, the, 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 the only way to access these farmers was to go there uh, with a four by four or with a truck and uh, talk to them and tell them, look, you know, we are a bank, uh, we are giving loans to grow your business, then you have to explain what is a loan. Uh, we also have being a, a double bottom line orga organization, meaning we are here for profit, we are a for profit organization, but we are also there for people. We have to be very transparent, we have to explain, you have to show, okay, this is how a loan works, you get this amount and you pay, and then, Usually the, this person will say, okay, I need to think, I need to talk to my family. And then you come next week and says, I want to take a loan of $500, $1,000, $1,500. And then um, um, you, you, you analyze the, the, the business of this person and then you give this loan. This is how it was in the past, uh, which of course, it's very difficult if you are the farmer because you cannot initiate anything. You cannot contact the institution, you cannot, talk to them, contact them and so on. And uh, without advancing our discussion, um, financial inclusion nowadays shifted 180 degrees by basically bringing the financial services to anybody through their phone. Now, this is a smartphone, but uh, um, phone penetration in Zambia is quite high. We are talking about 70, 80%. They are called, uh, these phones with buttons are called feature phones. Yeah? So now um, everybody can open an account. Also in the case of AB Bank Zambia, they will be able to apply for a loan at the end of the year. And in, in some months they will be able to save money from that side of the road, of this road, which was a dirt road and uh, it's very difficult to access and it's still quite far. But somehow you, you give the power and the accessibility to that farmer in the bush or uh, at the end of the road. 
Right. I don't know if this this uh, explains. No, perfectly. I mean, this, this is of course um, uh, obviously a very a very key question because having access precisely to information and as you said to new means of, of communication is very important to reach mm. your, uh, obviously your, your 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 potential clients and customers and to identify them and to make sure obviously that they meet the, the you know uh, the um, the objectives of financial inclusion. Yeah, and if I if I if I may, uh, because we, we we have quite some examples in this. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, it's it's not that simple. <laughs> you don't think that the, that farmer will will reach for his uh, his no. or her phone and then will start uh, dialing something. No more. They need to see somebody. They need to talk to somebody. Absolutely. Now, if this person is a bank employee, if this person is a, an agent, if this person is a, a, a former client, uh, this changes uh, depending on the context. Um, in the in the areas which are so called peri urban, it's most of the time a, a bank employee. Mm -hmm. uh, the areas which are very remote uh, is an agent, and uh, um, we have a, an, an amazing cooperation with the um, with the cooperative of such very small farmers. It's called Comaco. Comaco stands for Community Markets for Conservation, and uh, they have two hundred thousand of these farmers in the deep east of Zambia. Yeah, uh, really, it's something amazing. These are farmers that collect honey not from hives, you know, they collect wild honey, they go up in the trees, they they collect the hive <laughs> without cutting the tree, very important. And then they bring it to the next village and then they they put it together and then they bring it to a so-called bulking center. And uh, they are in the same situation, they, they are economically active. And uh, our cooperation with Comaco was uh, that we brought them um, our digital wallet and the person that talks to this farmer is a Comaco employee, which mm -hmm. already carries a, a big weight. Um, one last thing before uh, before I I, uh, I end this this part of my answer, we also have a, a hybrid model, which was I would say somehow popular in Germany maybe 50 years ago. It's called a savings bus. So you have a bank in a bus, like in a big truck. <laughs> And you can do quite some transactions in this bus. This bus has um, solar panels, by the way. It provides electricity to everybody. <clears throat> also has a free Wi-Fi. And then it goes in the villages. Yeah. It says, Look, this is the banking bus. You can, you can talk to us. You can open an account. We show you how uh, to, to transfer money and so on and so forth. So um, you, to those who say, you know, digitalization is now the, the big thing, it's not true. You need a human touch, especially yeah. financial inclusion. Yeah, absolutely. Especially for people that are not used to have access to financial services in general. Yeah. It's very important indeed to build a relationship first. Uh, uh, indeed, um, of course, again, communication technology can always support to, to develop this and to further sustain the, the, the relation once it is established. But uh, indeed, at the beginning, especially for people that do not necessarily have are not used to have access, you know, to go to a bank might be, might be sometimes a little bit scary so, to some occasions, right? Like um, uh, if you're not used to, uh, and can it also be overwhelming in terms of information you can get, etc. Uh, things that you have to, papers that you have to sign and all this. And, and obviously I think this 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 uh, establishing a relation is, is indeed something that makes quite a lot of sense in, in that context. We already have a couple of questions. Um, I will take them both. The first one is very interesting. I will keep it for slightly a little bit later. If you don't mind, Esther uh, Salimi. Um, but we have a, a question from from Denis. I mean, it's a little bit what we discussed already here. Is this question about um, uh, uh, what has AB Bank done to increase financial inclusion for small holder farmers? Because I mean, do you have any specific example of what you did specifically for small small holder farmers in, in the recent past? Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> the first the first uh, um, thing we did is to to uh, to bring our bank closer to them we have a this is the first thing we have a concept which is called satellite uh, which is like a bank agency uh, in the in the villages around the, around the big cities i think the furthest is quite far you know um, my, my colleague Muse is here i think it's uh, i don't know Quite, quite far the furthest. So um, I would say that because because the first obstacle, um, also riding on our discussion, the first obstacle is not necessarily the lack of access. The first obstacle is the lack of information. 
so that you know it's possible. So then you have to go there. This is the first thing we did. Second, uh, we did inner cooperation with the, the German develop, Development Cooperation, uh, the so-called um, crop cards, meaning um, it is an automated system that uh, gives us as an institution the possibility to evaluate instantly the, um, the business size of a farmer, depending on what the farmer plants, be it tomatoes, being beans, being soy. This, uh, this makes the, the, the financing process much faster. This is the second thing. The third thing we did, um, not, not, necess not necessarily especially for small for, for the farmers, um, but for everybody in Zambia is to give them a digital wallet. A digital wallet is like a bank account on your phone to provide a digital wallet to, to them, which is absolutely free of charge, um, which can be opened instantly, which has uh, no minimal balance and where they will be able to save. Saving is a, is a, is a huge buffer um, um, for, um, yeah, for, for emergencies. By the way, we work with the smallholder farmers in the bank, um, I think since 2014, 2015. So um, around seven years. Our biggest obstacle um, was to, was outreach, you know, because you have to go with the truck, you have to, um, with the four by four, you have to talk to the, to the farmer, not only to give loans, but just to give them access to financial inclusion. Yeah. So uh, now with our digital digital wallet, um, anybody can uh, can um, save, send, receive uh, money, and also apply for a loan. This will happen in, towards the end of the year. Yeah. Great. Thank you so Hope much. Thanks for the question. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, we have also a question here from um, uh, from um, from Christina Banuta. Hi, Cosmin and Alexandre. Hi, Christina. Um, what is needed, she asked, for, uh, from a regulatory perspective for technological solutions to work in the field, of course, of financial inclusion? Mm. Um, what, what, is, what has been uh, your experience in that in, in working in Zambia? Yeah, I, I have to say that uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate to, to be working in here because uh, uh, the regulator here, the, the central bank, is extremely professional and uh, uh, I, I think in the last five to 10 years, the, the country made big strides in, in this field and is now at par with the, with the champions in, in the continent and in East Africa, Kenya and Tanzania. Um, you, you need, uh, in order to, to work in a successful way, you need a, re a regulatory uh, framework. Some concrete examples. So usually uh, such farmers do not have their papers in order. And um, I know, for example, when, when I was working in Congo in the bank there, uh, to open a bank account uh, was quite an endeavor because the regulator said that in order to open a bank account, you need uh, to, to show uh, evidence of, I don't know, the the taste of your mother's milk, you know, so you had to go all the way um, <laughs> in, in the history. The regulator here in Zambia is uh, uh, very progressive, so it enables um, registration of, we call them low KYC, low know your client um, um, accounts. Of course, within certain limits, because of course you don't see these clients, but still they exist. They are people. Otherwise, no, they would <laughs> they would not uh, take a phone. So the regulator has to uh, provide an enabler framework to allow these people with low um, know your customer uh, standards who are not registered, who maybe don't have a good uh, um, uh, ID document, to come into the into the formal financial system. I think this is. This is the, the main the main thing, and not uh, treat everybody like a criminal. Yeah, you know, it's the job of the banks to manage their risk. Yeah, I suspect that this is probably one of the main obstacles, right? So this paperwork, as you mentioned, which is of course quite different from a country to another, and, and might be and maybe sometimes quite overwhelming for people precisely when they have to to go and in, in the bank or open an account or do whatever financial transacts, transactions they need to do. What just very quickly, what, what would be some other obstacles that you have come across uh, in your experience with the AB Bank Zambia 
in terms of precisely providing this type of financial inclusion services? What are, what are the other, let's say, bottlenecks or difficulties that you still have to, to address or you are still working on at the AB Bank uh, Zambia? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And I, I also see the, the questions are, are fantastic. Yes, they are coming. So I will, I will address them. <laughs> very, very good questions. Um, I think uh, 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 quite a big problem that we face in Zambia is um, the lack of trust for very good reasons. Um, in Not in the recent history, but um, in, in, the, in the past history, there were quite some financial institutions which went bust. Also, some banks. Uh, I I, um, uh, I know that uh, those who, who are familiar with the Zambia of the last uh, I don't know 10, 20 uh, years know this. So there is quite some some distrust um, to everything which has to do with uh, with money. Yeah. Uh, this is why uh, alone you cannot make a difference. You you have to go uh, with partnerships. Um, of course, there's a difference between the, the, the city population that sees a cool app or a cool product and says, let me try it. I know I, I know how to manage my, I put like 20, $10, $20 there and I see how it works. And oh, it works fine. There's a difference between this population and somebody in the village who has the whole savings, $10. Yeah. The, our uh, mission, our raison d'etre, if you want, uh, is to work with these people. And um, the only way to, to really touch masses of people is to, to go with partnerships in order to solve this, this issue of mistrust. So this is another, another big problem we, we face here. Right. Thanks. Um, thanks for that. We will, I'm sure we will come back to some, some other aspects probably later. There is, a, there is a first question. I didn't address it yet because I think it's maybe now the right time to take it. It's a question asked by Estamula Salimi. Um, he, he says uh, that that um, that financial inclusion can also bring a certain number of risks as well, right? So how can we have the balance between you know uh, risk at different levels? Mm -hmm. What kind of risks do you see attached to providing financial services to people? Um, financial skills, for instance, could be one one issue. But what what else do you see as a potential risk in, in that? Yeah, um, I, I would pick two. There are many, and very good question, by the way. And thank you, thank you, Salimi, for for asking this. Um, I will pick two: um, one risk for the institutions, and one risk for the customers, yeah. <clears throat> or for the users. Uh, the risk for the institution is um, that, of course, you you are accessible anytime, anywhere. Um, as I said, you interact with customers you did not see. So, of course, 99% uh, of the customers are very well intended, but the 1% who are not well intended will try to exploit every weakness in your, in your offering, in, in your systems. That's why you have to have your house in order <laughs> from an institutional perspective. It doesn't only apply in terms of digital financial services. It's just that the scale is much bigger. Uh, because this 1% could mean 10,000 10, uh, people who try to, <laughs> to take your system. You know? yeah. um, for the customers, it's even more, I would say, worrying or sad. And uh, it comes in relationship with um, um, unethical or uh, aggressive um, service offering. Uh, it, it happens in Kenya quite a lot. It's a big problem in Zambia, not yet, but it's becoming a problem. Uh, it's uh, basically related to the over indebtedness of um, of the customer. So when you make it so easy for everybody to get a loan of, uh, we are not talking big amounts, uh, maybe $10, $20, you will see that this person takes this loan on a Friday evening, um, goes drinking with the, with the friends and forgets to pay. Now, um, also talking to the, about the regulatory system, uh, in most of, if not all the countries, there is a credit bureau that um, records defaults of credit. So the whole, the whole setup backfires. Instead of bringing people in the formal financial sector and, uh, and increasing their inclusion, it just backfires by putting them on a blacklist and banning them from the, from the financial system 
for for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Uh, this is why the, one of the biggest risk is for is for customers who uh, fall basically prey to I don't know aggressive selling practices, aggressive lending practices. Uh, the mobile network operators uh, are giving these nano loans. Yeah. At very high interest rates. Now the problem if you don't pay them, um, you you go on 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 a blacklist, uh, which makes it very difficult for you to to access um, loans, for example, at, at at other institutions. So this is this is also a very big risk, which is uh, I would say systemic and involves the regulator. It involves uh, the financial service providers. It, it involves uh, those who should educate the customers. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. Perhaps in relation to that, it's another question from uh, from Salimi as well. Uh, it's it's the this idea of how do you assess precisely in your microfinance activities in Zambia, uh, the village level. He he writes, um, uh, how do you assess perhaps the um, the credit worthiness or the or how do you process that uh, when when it comes to provide a loan, for instance? Yeah, uh, very good question, and I, I think that Salimi is coming from the industry. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, also for for uh, um, our our friends in the in the in the call, um, it's it's helpful to have a, a distinction between uh, two ways of financial inclusion or microfinance: the group uh, microfinance and the individual one. Uh, group microfinance or group financial inclusion relies heavily on groups and uh, on peer pressure. Uh, individual one. Uh, only deals with the, the individual customers. Uh, AB Bank Zambia is doing 99.99%, I would say, or exclusively, almost exclusively individual uh, uh, rural finance. Um, groups are very strong in Zambia. There are savings group, lending groups, saving and lending groups. Uh, we rely on those groups, nevertheless, um, for uh, feedback for um, uh, moral uh, uh, moral pressure. Yeah. Uh, concretely, when, when somebody wants to take a loan, you go and ask the neighbors, is this person a good farmer? Does he treat his family well? Uh, if the answer is yes, um, that's, uh, that's a very good point, uh, which, which uh, leads to the approval of the loan, provided the business is also sound. Um, so this is how we involve, we involve the groups. Uh, I, I also, I'm also uh, not hiding that we are we are thinking of um, of the way to um, also provide uh, services to these groups because they they also rely on each other and the, the group members. So um, it's something that we we don't want to miss. But uh, traditionally, um, access holding access uh, AB Bank micro AB Bank uh, uh, Zambia and uh, um, access microfinance holding our our mother company is doing individual microfinance. Okay, great. Thank you, Kasmin. Um, I have a question here from Talon Mohan, um, who, who is asking uh, that, uh, you know, we uh, since a lot of people in Zambia have non-smartphones, mm. um, how do you ensure that they can still have access to financial services um, uh, through through the telephones, to the mobiles, uh, like bill payments, uh, self-help mm. groups, microfinance, etc.? How does mm. that work? Yeah, Tarun, thank you very much for the question. Fantastic question and uh, um, um, a key point, <laughs> a key point. So if you want to do financial inclusion, um, the, the key here is called the uh, USSD banking. USSD means um, um, SMS-based uh, banking, meaning with, you remember it's all Nokia phones with the buttons. <laughs> yeah, I do remember very well, yes. <laughs> yeah, so uh, um, you have to provide a service through this, uh, uh, that, that such phones can access it. Uh, this is called USSD. Uh, sorry for the technical uh, jargon here. Um, uh, it basically means that it works with any kind of phones. You don't need data. You don't need an app. Um, uh, you just press a, a short code. In, in the case of AB Bank, it's star 888 hash. And then you have a, a SMS menu where you say, OK, uh, send money, receive money, save. And you press one, save money to where you put the number and then uh, it's it's gone. But very good question, and this this makes a huge uh, a huge difference. Otherwise, if you talk about an app, you can forget about it. Yeah, sure. 
I remember a long time ago, I, I used to recharge my, my phone in Vietnam using this uh, USB <laughs> technology. Yes. So, yes. <laughs> I remember that with my old phone. So, <laughs> yeah. Right yeah by the way uh, our our uh, our guests are from different continents and different areas in africa uh, sub saharan africa ussd is huge it's yeah it's the yeah. the platform of choice it's fast you don't need data it's uh, responsive yeah and it's a good uh, i mean it's a, it's a pertinent technological choice in in mm. in, in, the, in that context so of course it works very well we have a question as well from uh, from john sorber hi john Good to have you with us. Um, if the micro loan are so small, 500, uh, between 500 and 1,500, aren't the bank processing admin costs too high percentage wise to manage the loan? He asks, uh, how can the bank make money without needing to charge high interest rates like those in the West, for instance, uh, mobile phone loans or salary advances uh, are around 20 or 30%. So how do you you know how do you actually make this of course um service also uh, valuable for you in terms of you know uh, in terms of activities so that you don't lose money in this kind of um, in this kind of uh, financial inclusion services yeah john uh, great question and uh, <laughs> you're not making my 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 talk easy um yeah this is the this is the curse of microfinance or financial inclusion. The, the blessing is that you can really provide a life change, not life changing, like a, a bit of a um, situation changing loan of $500. And you can do it, you can do it uh, in the ground, on the ground, and this is the blessing. Now, what is the curse? Of course, the admin costs are outrageously high. And I mean outrageously high here, uh, for those of you who are in Zambia, you know that our neighbor across the street is one of the oldest banks. Um, now, because you, you, you took the amount 500 to 1,500, it's exactly our average loan amount is right in the middle, $1,000. Uh, now, for our neighbors across the street, one of the biggest uh, and oldest banks in Zambia, to mobilize <clears throat> $1 million, they need one transaction, one contract, and uh, one client. For us to mobilize $1 million, we need 1,000 transactions, 1,000 contracts, 1,000 clients, 1,000 signatures, 1,000 trips to the customer, so 1,000 times more effort. Now, can you charge an interest rate 1,000 times higher? No. <laughs> uh, and this is why the, one of the biggest problems also that the, the bank in Zambia had was uh, profitability because the margins are extremely low, although the interest rates are very high, yeah, compared to the market rates. Yeah, we are not talking how much about. Mean, more or less, just to have an idea, how much would the interest rate would be? Look, uh, this is a this is a very interesting question. So, uh, you and um, it's not that I don't want to answer, but. Uh, in order to ask, to answer, to understand this question, first of all, one should ask, what is the inflation rate? Of course. So if I tell you that the inflation rate in Zambia is twenty percent, then uh, you you would uh, you would not compare. You would what do you compare? Then one has to uh, ask, um, basically, what are your uh, so-called refinancing costs? Because yeah. in order to give this money, you have to get this money. Now, where do you get it? And uh, if I tell you, uh, your refinancing costs are. Uh, 20 to 30 percent then to answer your question you realize that in order to make money you have to have minimum 20 percent inflation plus 20 to 30 percent the cost of your funds yeah. and this doesn't cover your uh, rent of your premises doesn't cover the salaries of your 500 staff <laughs> we have 500 staff in some yeah and doesn't cover the the hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars needed to maintain this technological infrastructure yeah. so it's very complicated um, it's a very complicated environment. However, I'm very happy to say that um, uh, through, and this was also a problem of microfinance, the cost to the, uh, to the customer, to the, end, uh, to the end customer, because you say, look, we do financial inclusion, but you are charging interest rate of 30, 40, 50, 60% per annum. This is the range to answer your question. Yeah. Then you say, hmm. This is uh, not good because you compare with 5% in the West. Yeah, OK, <laughs> come here. <laughs> come here. It's not so simple, but uh, nevertheless, it can be much better. 
Yeah, I mean, we don't have 20% no, inflation in Switzerland. Exactly, so. yeah. But now I, I'm telling you something. Um, two things, first of all. Um, the digitalization is also a, a means to an end. It's an enabler to reduce these costs because everything was pen and paper. So with digitalization, we managed to reduce um, uh, the costs and therefore also the, the, um, the interest rate of our loans. And another thing, we will give savings to, to everybody in the country, giving them a 10% interest rate. This will be the highest in the, the, highest in the country, the highest in the market uh, with a digital wallet. So yeah, it's, it's complicated. Okay. Uh, to uh, show a uh, very very uh, good question from john short answer um yeah no it's, it's i think i think you, you put you know the the thing on the most important aspects <laughs> yeah. and how complicated it is precisely you cannot come up with an ideal interest rate because it has to fit in the context right and as you yeah. really demonstrated it's important to keep that in mind when we are talking this uh, these issues uh, but also you highlight the main problems is indeed to reach a one million you have to have a thousand clients because mm -hmm. the average loan is a thousand so it multiplies the cost of transactions by thousand right so it's easier to have one client with one million than thousand clients with the thousand us dollars mm -hmm. uh, as you as you as you said uh, just in relation to that before i take some more questions we have many more questions i hope we will be able to address all of them uh, but but just very quickly on that note um precisely um, Cosmin, what are your relations with traditional donors? How do they fit in your in your in your activities? Do they have any relations with traditional bilateral agencies, whether the Germans, the Swiss, or the French, mm -hmm. or, or multilateral agencies? How do they help you to to support precisely these kind of operations, or to 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 kind of cover the risks also a little bit that you take in your activities? Do you have any kind of relations with these organizations, or do you try to stay away and to remain purely private oriented? Uh, bank with no so much connections with traditional donors. Yeah, um, thank you, thank you, Alexander, for for this question. We are uh, we AB Bank Zambia and uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, similar institutions. We are a strange animal because um, we are not a bank, but uh, we are a bank <laughs> by all means. Uh, we are not uh, um, an NGO, um, but we have a double bottom line. Uh, so we are somehow um, in a in a funny in a funny position. So um, because of the reasons why we that, that I, I explained earlier, um, the profitability of the bank uh, is not what uh, any uh, investor in a bank would expect. But this is not a problem because our uh, investor, our investors, who by the way are um, the international, the World Bank through their uh, International Finance Corporation investment arm, the Development Bank of Germany, <laughs> the Development Agency of the French Republic, and our mother company, which has similar shareholders. Um, these shareholders are have a very long term perspective, and uh, uh, without this perspective and without this. Uh, let's say donor view, we wouldn't be able to be here today. So this perspective says, first, we want you to see that you reach your mandate of financial inclusion. Uh, we want to see that uh, you have an impact. And then the, uh, we want to see that you recover your losses. Yeah. So this is, this is the approach. Uh, and then of course, um, uh, if you want to become a successful institution, then you have to grow. There are uh, from from I hope there are colleagues who, who are from Latin America. There are uh, huge examples. I'm talking about Mi Banco. I'm talking about Banco Sol. Um, huge institutions who started like like we are, uh, maybe 20, 30 years ago, and now they are uh, giant financial institutions. Also doing the same thing we do. Yeah. Thanks, Cosmin. We still have uh, roughly around 10 minutes left um, uh, before the end of the session. We, we still have a lot of questions, so we'll try to group them a little bit together and also give the voice to those of you who didn't have the chance to ask questions yet. There are a couple of questions uh, from Salimi and Eric, I think, um, about um, a little bit the um, uh, what's, what's the duration of the loan a little bit, how much time mm -hmm. does it need to be taken to, to be repaid, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what's the average here of practice at TAB uh, Bank Zambia? Yeah, so the, the, I, I will also drop, by the way, in the, in the chat, uh, 
um, uh, some links uh, to our YouTube channel, our Facebook page, our LinkedIn page. Um, the average loan amount uh, is in the range of $1,000. And the average, it's called maturity, the average length is, um, I would say, 10 months, 10, 10 to 12 months. OK, great. Thank, thank you. Um, uh, that was useful. Um, there is a there's a question here from um, um, from um, Elusine Badri about uh, asking if the bank uh, use outsourced technology to develop your financial solutions or how does that work? Mm, yeah, very good question. Um, I think it also applies in development, and I think in development is a very big problem. You should never reinvent the wheel, yeah. although. It's very nice to say, ah, I invented a wheel. Somebody did it before you. So um, as much as you can um, use existing systems, structures, partnerships, ecosystems, and bring something extra. So it's not, not only, it does not only apply to IT, doesn't only apply to banking, doesn't only apply to financial inclusion. I, I think Alexander, you know much better than me. I think it also applies in the, in the field of international development. Do not reinvent the wheel. If you cannot bring something on top, uh, then don't waste your time and money. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So absolutely. a very strong, uh, yes, definitely. If somebody knows to do some things better than we do, uh, Yes, they should do it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you, Kasmin. Um, I have another interesting question that was also somewhere in my mind um, from uh, from Nina uh, Dugu that is asking if you conduct financial literacy training for your new clients before approving credits to them. Uh, again, this resonates a little bit with what we said earlier when you know when it comes to find find the clients, the customers. Um, that sometimes you know this paperwork can be a little bit overwhelming. And that you need perhaps some sort of, of financial literacy to to you know to understand a little bit about interest rates, how does it work, etc. So how do you do that? Do you is it something that you provide as a service, or do you work with training institutions that do that? Um, how, or if any, or, or if you, perhaps you don't do anything about that? So what, what's mm -hmm. the, your, your policy? Uh, very good question. Thank you so much. So um, short answer, yes. Uh, long answer. Um, there are different levels of financial literacy trade. Yeah, um, each and every customer of AB Bank, <laughs> when when before they get a loan, they are told what a loan is, how does it work, what is interest, how much they have to pay, uh, what is the total so-called capital and interest that they have to pay at the end, what is the date of the payment, when do they have to pay, what are the taxes and uh, all the fees attached, if any, to them. Um, this happens to every every customer. This is one thing we do. Um, by the way, also the bank uh, um, got uh, it's got two awards for, for uh, financial literacy, AB Bank Zambia, um, um, for for the work we do in um, in promoting savings. Now, let's not only think about loans. Let's also talk about savings. This is very important. Uh, when okay, when you give a loan, it's very easy, but when you when you ask somebody to save, you have to tell them, look, this is how it works, we are safe, this is how you can get your money. So this is uh, also something we have to do. Then um, we, are, we have also strong partnerships with two institutions that are doing a lot in this financial literacy training. This is the uh, GIZ, the, the German uh, Development Corporation, and the Sparkasse Stiftung, the, the Savings Bank uh, um, Association of, of Germany. Uh, and uh, with them, we provide training to our farmers. And we are talking about tens of thousands of uh, farmers, clients, uh, I wanted to say clients, farmers among them, who receive these trainings. Yes, thank you so much, Kasmin. We have here an interesting question also that resonates a little bit. I mean, again, we have plenty of questions and um, I'm afraid I'm not sure we will be able to answer all of them. <laughs> but I'd like to, to take uh, one of the questions in relation to what we just discussed with this, um, you know, um, development, um, uh, other development, I mean, other actors involved in your financial services. This is a question from Jan Sayers. Um, Kasmi, you mentioned the GIZ and Propaco uh, mm. also benefit from portfolio guarantees from donors, from other donors, for instance. Mm. That was also his question. 
Yeah, uh, thank you. <laughs> very good question. I didn't say about Propago, but somebody made their homework. So very good question. Yes, uh, Propago is uh, uh, is our shareholder, and yes, we have um, uh, um, um, uh, a guarantee from them. This is it's an interesting construct. So. Um, um, how does this guarantee work? Um, usually we say, okay, this business is too risky. And then uh, Propago says, okay, we help you um, um, provide financing to more risky agro businesses, for example. You know, maize is always risky because it's, uh, you know, you have to have a big surface and uh, it's not so, the, the, the fluctuation is, of prices is very high. Um, but with with such a with such a construct that you have like a three party, you know, the the financier, uh, like a risk sharing partner, and the and the customer, um, you can you can extend the um, financing to to more risky businesses. Okay, thank thank you so much for for that. There there is one question uh, uh, that that could be. Um, I'm just checking the time. Yeah, we still have five minutes left. Um, that um, that is interesting here. It's a question that was. I also had like a similar question um, a little bit to, to understand a bit what are the benefits of, of greater financial inclusion in Zambia. And this is a question from William uh, Fisea. Uh, with mm. the financial inclusion strategy your bank is implementing, have you been able to bring a long term impact of alleviating people out of poverty? She she he or she asks. So um, what is a little bit here your your take on that? Mm. That's a political question. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to say yes. Uh, unfortunately, the life is much more complicated. So <clears throat> I, I will also say in the context of Zambia. So what people struggle with in Zambia, first of all, is service delivery of yeah. electricity, water. Yeah, there is nothing we can do about it. Yeah. Um, what also people are struggling is the access to medical services. There's yeah. nothing we can do about it. So, yeah, I, I, maybe it's a, it's a good uh, circle, yeah? Uh, uh, financial inclusion is not, as much as everybody would like to paint it, is not a tool to alleviate poverty. If it would be so simple, you know, I, I would get I would get a Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> but uh, it's just an enabler. It's just an enabler. And uh, I also want to and thank you for this question and for allowing us to clarify maybe a not so comfortable truth. People who are in poverty do not need financial inclusion. They need clean water. They need a safe place to sleep, and they need to have uh, enough calories to, to to put on the table for them and their family. Financial inclusion doesn't play any role. You could say World Food Program is sending money to 2,000 refugees in Zambia via mobile money, yes. Fine, but uh, it's not this that uh, takes people out of poverty. Now, the moment you are above this poverty level and uh, you want to save some money, this is where financial inclusion comes because it offers you protection and um, it allows you to have the money safe so that your husband doesn't beat you at the end of the week and gets the money or uh, people steal it uh, from you when you go from the when you come from the market I, this is what i can contribute to this thanks because i think the, the what you mentioned i think is it's uh, it's really interesting uh is this this as you said it's an enabler right to precisely um give a chance of people to further improve their own uh, situation uh, indeed, so I think it's really part of this more comprehensive economic development policies that the country can implement, or at a local level, or at a regional level, depending, of course, in which country you are in which context. But it's indeed I like this idea of uh, of enabling, you know, something else. Uh, it's not an end goal; it's something that should, you know, help you to continue to get out of poverty. In other words, um, if I may formulate this um, this way, um, Cosmin, it's already one uh, p.m. here in, in Geneva. Um, <laughs> And I still have a lot of questions, but I'm afraid, yeah. uh, we, and I'm really, I apologize to um, our audience for not having had the time to address all of them. Um, again, it's a very interesting questions here. Uh, I'm not sure I will ask to see my 
my with my colleagues if we can keep a track of those questions and see how well we can perhaps maybe we can have another another talk in, in yes some maybe <laughs> <laughs> we can do the number two at another stage yeah yeah with, exactly. perhaps with a certain focus and invite another speaker so that we can also have a kind yeah. of, a, of a discussion together on certain specific yeah. issues uh, that would be great uh, but I would like to thank you very much, Cosmin, for your time. Thank you very much for your participation in this very lively discussion we had with our audience on this financial inclusion and development. And thank you so much for spending the time and, and also explaining us how uh, this works um, in the case of AB Zambia. Um, I think that was really a very interesting example of taking from the context of Zambia. So thank you very much uh, for this. Thank you very much also to our audience for the questions. And again, apologies if we didn't have time to address them all in one hour time. Uh, it was challenging. And again, the ground to be covered was relatively uh, relatively broad. But thank you so much for your uh, very stimulating questions. And I think um, I think we had, a, we had a good discussion. And we touched upon, I think, very concrete and important issues in relation to financial inclusion. Um, and that we can, of course, take again for perhaps another discussion together, Cosmin, uh, one of these days on financial inclusion, because, of course, there's still a lot of things to be said uh, about this. So once again, thank you very much, Cosmin. It was a pleasure to yeah, have you with yeah. us. Thank you, Alexander. If you if you would allow, I also would like to thank uh, our friends here that uh, that took their time from their busy schedules to 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 look at us and talk to us. And uh, very very many questions for the um, for the uh, very many thanks for the great questions. Um, um, my colleague Mataoka and I also put in the chat if you want to see uh, also a video about what we do. Uh, go to our YouTube channel. It's called AB Bank Zambia TV. And uh, you will also see there the testimonial of a farmer customer who yeah. who named uh, one of her bulls AV Bank. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, I wish you a great week ahead. Uh, stay safe and um, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Kasmin, and a special thanks also to my. Uh, I saw that some of our uh, Afghan friends were also attending this discussion, so a special thanks to them as well for for joining us. Um, thank you to everybody. It was a pleasure to have you. I wish you a nice day and a nice week ahead. And again, stay stay safe, please. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Have a nice day.